on Sky News Australia. This is the Rita Panahi Show. Good evening and welcome to the Rita Panahi Show. Coming up tonight, the usual suspects blaming misogyny and sexism for Sam Kerr's racism scandal. Douglas Murray will join me to talk about Biden's worst nightmare coming true and it's not what you think. Darren Grimes with the latest from the UK and Prue McSween with the latest local news and plenty of lefties losing it as always. And also joining me tonight is a former police commissioner, Kerl Glare, with a warning about governments around the country raising the age of criminal responsibility. But first to Victoria, where for a decade the inept Andrews Allen governments have been in power. In that time, they have plunged Victoria into crippling debt, the biggest state debt in the country, and by some margin, they inflicted six devastating unnecessary lockdowns and repeatedly breached the most basic integrity standards from the systematic rorting of the red shirt saga to the politicisation of the justice system, including, sadly, the police force. State Labor has managed to do all of that while implementing the most far-left social and cultural reforms, including the most extreme radical gender theory that currently allows a male-bodied sexual predator who identifies as a woman to be jailed at Melbourne's largest female prison. Think about that. A sexual predator with a penis is in a female prison. Any competent opposition would be counting down the days to the next state election, expecting a landslide victory, but not the thoroughly hopeless, ideologically barren clowns of the Victorian Liberal Party led by John Pesudo. He is a man so bereft of political nous that only the Liberal Party would be silly enough to elect him as leader. As I wrote back in March 2023, Pesuto is a dead man walking. He was done as soon as he launched his irrational, politically stupid and possibly defamatory attack against first-term MP Moira Deeming. Pursuta right now faces not one, not two, but three credible defamation suits thanks to the ham-fisted amateur antics of his office, including that 15-page dossier that was circulated to MPs and the media. That John Pursuto has held on for this long is a testament to the lack of talent and depth in the Victorian Liberal Party. The political missteps under his leadership are too numerous to list, uh, from policy blunders like backing a treaty with the Indigenous population to personnel blunders like hiring as Director of Communications and Strategy a man who had applied to work for Daniel Andrews twice. The bad news for the Libs is that the likely replacements aren't much better than Pesudo, with Sam Groth and Brad Batten, the front runners right now. Sam Groth is a newbie who interrupted his holiday in Fiji to fly back to Melbourne to vote against Moira Deeming. And Brad Batten, well, he backs the Labor Green policy of increasing the age of criminal responsibility. No wonder Labor are confident. They know if an election was held today, they'd win and they'd win in a landslide. <sighs> Joining me now is Sky News contributor Prue McSween. Prue, we have learnt more details today. The racial slur allegedly hurled by Matilda's captain, Samantha Kerr, at a London police officer is reportedly stupid white bastard. This alleged comment saw her charged with intentionally causing racially aggravated harassment, alarm or distress to a police officer. She has pled not guilty um, and is hoping to have the charges dismissed. They've certainly taken a long time to, to get to this stage. But, Prue, what's been interesting also today is the usual suspects, including Jane Caro, claiming that Sam Kerr is copying far harsher treatment because of her gender. I hope that we don't treat a female football player worse than we treat male football players who fall from grace, which, you know, many of them have done and in much more serious ways than Sam Kerr has just done, um, because we sometimes have this double standard where we expect women to behave much better than men and when they don't, we punish them uh, even more harshly. 
What do you make of that? Do you believe that uh, Sam is copying harsher treatment than a male in her position would be? Absolutely not. In fact, what's she copped so far? Uh, she has now uh, got to address these allegations and rightly so. I, I find it astounding that, uh, well, we've got Premier Minns also coming out. Look, it's a fallen idol. She's a role model. Of course, most Australians love Sam Kerr, but she's got to face the music. And if, as, as is alleged, that she actually got sick in the back of a, a taxi and then she abused the police, well, then she's got to address that. Uh, we, we look today at how uh, the Roosters player, Lenny Yu, is, has had to apologise for his slur against another player and the club has come out and apologised too. I think that most of us would forgive Sam and give her the kind of support that, you know, we all would like to be able to give her if she owned it, if she came out and said, look, you know, I may have done something that I'm not proud of. I apologise. But she's got to be mindful of the fact that there are young kids who treat her as a total role model. And I just think she's really gone about it the wrong way. And as far as the Jane Carrows of the world, well, they're just talking baloney. <laughs> well, you might remember Jane Carroll also said that uh, Barnaby Joyce would have been sacked or his career would have ended if uh, if he was a woman, forgetting mm. that just a few months earlier, Lydia Thorpe had a uh, incident outside a Melbourne strip club, which you could argue was far worse than Barnaby's exactly. offence, and uh, she's, she's still sitting in the Senate. As far as Sam Kerr goes, she's innocent until proven guilty, so I'm not in any way judging her yet because uh, if she didn't say what she is alleged to have said but she has been an activist for race issues so I can understand why so many people are looking at this and going well if she's guilty she's also a massive hypocrite. Now let's move along to this a brilliant column by Terry McCran who's painting a bleak picture of the Australian economy and is a column today he talks about the most recent GDP data uh, showing an economy that is sick, seriously sick. He writes, it's an economy that is being held up barely by a bizarre and explosively volatile and quite simply unreliable combination of China-driven demand for our iron ore, coal and natural gas and the utterly out of control flood of 1,500 migrants every single day of the year, weekends included. Prude seems that governments of all stripes are hooked on this migration strategy where you create economic activity through migration, but it's not guaranteed to uh, lead to better living standards. I don't think anyone watching this show needs statistics uh, read out and released over the last day or so uh, to understand that this economy is really going backwards. You know, we're live, do, everyone is doing it tough. And we know it's going to get tougher because we have a situation where uh, consumer demand's gone down because none of us can afford to buy the things that we want. So that's going to lead to unemployment. Uh, we've got this incredible rise in immigration. These people are coming here. They have nowhere to live. Uh, they'll be taking jobs of other Australians if they can get one. Uh, you know, what's going to be fascinating, though, Rita, is... Um, what, whether it will have impact on the timing of the election because, you know, Albanese is so busy handing out and today we hear he's going to pay super on paid parental leave. That's another $250 million for about 180,000 Australians. We've got all the aged care handouts, the there's, you know, childcare handouts, uh, the NDIS, the economy, they're spending like, you know, it's no tomorrow, and yet we're really all doing it so tough, and the pipe has got to be paid sometime. So I think it'll be fascinating to see. And in the midst of all of this, they never talk about productivity as they're handing out more pay rises to public servants and all the unions. Uh, they don't talk productivity, and without it, this country is going to go backwards. So I think we're going for an, in for a, a rougher ride, sadly, and uh, we're all going to be paying a huge price. Now, this story has got tongues wagging today. I've uh, had 
heard so many discussions uh, online, on, on radio, in the office <laughs> regarding Virgin Australia's announcement. Uh, I think Virgin Australia have got a shock because when they made the announcement that they're looking at allowing pets in the cabin so you can have your puppy or kitten or I don't know, emotional support duck sitting right there with you, <laughs> I think they thought it was going to just be... Uh, Adulation. People were going to be celebrating. They were going to get nothing but good press. But certainly on Talkback and what I've heard, there's a lot of people with grievances, worried about dogs uh, pooping on the plane, uh, barking. People have uh, talked about being on flights overseas where there has been a pet that has disturbed the entire cabin, people with uh, allergies to cats. <laughs> How did you receive this news? Are you looking forward to flying with your pooch? Absolutely not. I don't have one, but I would never inflict a, an animal on others. You know, we just know that some people even have allergies towards animals. So, uh, you know, yeah. I think some operational marketing gurus decided that this was a great marketing opportunity for them to cut through. If they want to do it, just des designate maybe one or two flights a day and that's it. And those pet lovers or people who really, you know, want to, who cannot bear to be parted from their companion can, uh, you know, avail themselves. But don't inflict it on the rest of us. I think it's a bad move by Virgin. Uh, if they want to pursue it, just make sure you discriminate and just have a, a couple of flights a week or day and that's it. Well, the short flights, um, I wouldn't have an issue because even if you've got a barking dog, if it's, you know, Melbourne to Sydney, but if you're flying for four, five, six, even much, lo if you're going overseas and you've mm. got uh, an animal that's agitated or pooping in the cabin, mm. oh, goodness me, yeah, you're going to have a few complaints. <laughs> uh, Swain, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Joining me now is best-selling author Douglas Murray. Douglas, let's start with Biden's worst nightmare. This is according to the Wall Street Journal. And it's black and Hispanic voters abandoning him for Trump. The former president is picking up support from minority voters because they did better in his economy. What do you make of this a phenomenon of minority voters leaving the Democrats for Trump? Well, they've been trying to deal with it for some years and they haven't been dealing with it very well. Um, you'll remember, Rita, that in the Trump years, uh, whenever any of the mainstream media noticed the fact that black and Hispanic Americans were actually voting for Donald Trump in larger numbers than for previous Republican presidents and contenders, um, they, they, they really didn't know how to interpret this. And that's why they kept on falling back to the idea that actually these were a new type of white supremacist, um, usually a you know, Hispanic <laughs> white supremacist or a black white supremacist. Um, and it, it, it's very curious that I, I predict the same thing will happen in this cycle if, if Trump and Biden uh, continue to be the likely contenders. Uh, they will continue, the media will continue to try to find ways to um, not understand these voters, um, but to demonize them or castigate them in some way. But of course, it is, as you mentioned, it is a very interesting um, observation that, that that black voters and, uh, and other ethnic minority voters would be turning to Trump in larger numbers. It says something about his economic policies. It says something about Biden's economic policies and much more. So I do hope this time some of the media actually uh, uh, looks into the story rather than just trying to demonize the subject. Well, Trump has won substantial gains with non-white voters. Uh, this is according to the latest New York Times Siena poll released over the weekend. Hispanic voters now actually favour Trump over Joe Biden by a six-point margin. I mean, if you said that, I don't know, 10 years ago, even five years ago, you would have been called crazy. But I tell you, Douglas, not uh, everyone is coping with this new data. Uh, have a look at this Discussion between former NBA star Charles Barkley and CNN's Gail King. First of all, so. I'm just going to say this. If I see a black person walking around with Trump mugs, I'm going to punch him in the face. Charles. I know, Gail. Charles. Gail. Gail, Gail you, I, you really can't say that because, A, you don't mean that. Oh, I mean that sincerely. <laughs> 
How persuasive is celebrity opinion, celebrity endorsement, or celebrity shaming like we saw, saw there for um, black voters, female voters, and, and young voters? Uh, is this a factor in the election? Uh, no, I mean, celebrity endorsements have, have been shown to be absolutely no use for many cycles now. Um, it, not, not least by uh, Donald Trump's initial election win in 2016, where, um, you know, all the celebrity class came out against him. And it turned out the celebrity class weren't weren't large enough in number, Rita, to uh, make up for the voters. Uh, uh, it's a very, very interesting thing because, of course, the more that people talk that sort of talk, uh, the more that they enjoy uh, ridiculing uh, not just the candidate, but anyone who would vote for him, uh, the more they just sort of expose themselves actually to a different type of political instinct, which is the political instinct of, I'm going to kick at you all. And actually, that instinct, you know, not only can I uh, can I get the the uh, rival, I can actually I can kick out all of those people who've been hectoring me and lecturing me from high moral positions for years. I can kick at all of you and it's going to feel good. Uh, so the more the more that people talk like that and talk down to the to, to potential Trump voters, indeed, voters of any kind. Uh, the more I think they'll realise that they lose the public. I agree 100% there. But then I do look at someone like, I don't know, Taylor Swift, who is so adored. She just toured Australia and the euphoria was insane. And I wonder whether the, the young voters, the young women who look up to her would just blindly follow her endorsement. Uh, we might discuss that closer to the election. Uh, I'm interested in your take, Douglas, on this speech on leadership by an United States Air Force Academy Lieutenant Colonel uh, Bree Fram. Have a listen. All too often, I hear leaders talk about providing everyone with dignity and respect like it's an aspirational goal. That's not good enough. Dignity and respect is the bare minimum. It's the floor of where we can be. We must set our sights higher and focus on intentional inclusivity. So for all of you out there, I ask you to set out your symbols of pride, share your pronouns in your email, particularly if you're a person who doesn't think they need to, Initiate difficult conversations about racial and gender barriers and share a bit of a vo your vulnerability in a way that draws others in. You can just imagine China or Russia watching that uh, and being terrified of the US military. Uh, Fram is reportedly one of the highest ranking transgender officers in the United, United States military. And it's clear from that speech, Douglas, that there is an agenda there to embed this sort of activism in the military, uh, things like declaring your pronouns, listing them on your emails and on your business cards. What do you think of this? I mean, it's, it's preposterous, isn't it? Let's just start with the tone of those remarks. I mean, it's it's like somebody, it's, it's not just sort of passive aggressive, um, it's it's pretty much aggressive, aggressive, that tone, isn't it? The, <laughs> I'm yes. going to tell you what you need to do, and especially those of you who don't think you need to know. Um, I, I mean, it, it's it's no way to speak to anyone, is, is the first observation. And, and by the way, I love that camera uh, uh, draw out onto the audience of um, sparsely <laughs> attended poor blokes who are sitting there being hectored uh, by this presumably male to female transsexual, um, uh, 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 telling them all that they have to put their pronouns in their bio. And they must all just be sitting there thinking, uh, I hope this ends soon. But I, I would say not only that I w would want the lecture to end soon, I'd want the whole era to end soon. Uh, and it will at some point, and I think I can say that with some confidence, mm -hmm. it will end at some point because... You know, countries really don't have the luxury of doing this if they're the world's hyperpower uh, and if they're the country with the most serious military in the world that is effectively responsible for securing the peace around the world or otherwise. 
Um, you know, they, they just don't have time for this stuff. And there will come a day, I don't know how soon it'll be or how far away it'll be, but there will come a day when these hectoring trans activists, they, them pronoun people just all have to go away uh, because everything will have become too serious again. Uh, you know, in one way, it's, it's, of course, ridiculous that we live in this era. On the other, in some ways, we should count our lucky stars that we actually... Uh, you know, that the, the situation is still not serious enough that people would actually be uh, put up with being talked at like that. Douglas, we've had Super Tuesday. Nikki Haley has finally backed out of the race. It's, as we expected, Trump v Biden. Uh, what do you think that means for the rest of the world? The, the conflict in Ukraine, the conflict in Gaza, China's aggression, uh, I know this is not an easy question, but you're about the only person who could uh, give us a meaningful answer. Of course, in some ways, going to be absolutely fascinating, in other ways, quite depressing to have a, a rerun um, of 2020 uh, again. But, but you know, here we are. Um, it'll be very interesting. I think the thing to watch out for is, is I and mean, we know pretty much what Biden's policies are going to be. Um, he's been running on them for the last four years. We know the sort of direction of travel. I think the interesting thing to watch out will be what Trump says, of course, on the campaign trail. Um, because whatever people think of him as a candidate, he does actually try to stick to the broad outline of what he's promised in the in the run, in all of those stadium events and others that he'll 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 be enjoying doing in in the months ahead. Um, if he does start to make noises about Ukraine, uh, you know, I think I think you could sort of pretty much believe them. And uh, the same same with the Middle East. China, of course, is uh, for Trump a very important issue, and it's important because he's the politician who changed the weather on China, uh, in not just the states mm. but in the world. He took an extremely unpopular position in regarding uh, China as the hostile competitor that it is um, at a time when everyone else was just wanting to hoover up the Chinese money on offer. Um, it'll be very interesting to, 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 to watch him on this issue because he has actually tilted not just the Republican Party, but the Democrats too on the China issue. So if he decides to run on it in a more hawkish direction, that'll definitely be worth noting. Beijing will note it, as will other allies and, and uh, potential uh, uh, rivals and enemies around the world. Now, before you go... Um... It's clear now that the Republican Party is Trump's party. I think there's little doubt about that. Uh, what does that mean for America? And what does that mean for politicians uh, in the UK, perhaps here in Australia, who have ignored their base? I think what's happened with this Trump phenomenon is entirely because of the GOP for so many years saying one thing to, to win power and then when they have that power, behaving entirely differently. Yes, I mean, I, I think that the the uh, Trumpification of the Republican Party is is, is obviously, you know, if, 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 at a conclusion in a way. Um, the, the party has done everything it can uh, to try to uh, replace him and it just, just hasn't worked. Even him sitting out all the debates just got him a bigger and bigger lead. Every indictment against him gets him a bigger mm. and bigger lead. Uh, I think that the, the the challenge for the party is that so many people, and it's the same for conservatives and others abroad who, um, who have said critical things about Trump, uh, there has been a rush uh, to say um, as many negative things about Trump as possible uh, for lots of reasons, many of them just well-founded, based in people's analysis of his character. On other occasions, as with some conservative politicians abroad, totally futilely just to sort of insult him and to gain some virtue points with their and his opponents. Um, the problem for them all is that Trump really doesn't forget that sort of stuff. Um, and I, I was I was speculating last night with some people that I I, th I think it's going to be very interesting if he does win and the polls currently show that he would in a runoff against Biden. Um, it was a big question of how he fills the administration, uh, how he fills positions. It was pretty tough uh, last time after the 2016 win. I think it'd be very tough this time, unless there's some kind of packs in the Republican Party and people who previously badmouthed Trump 
are allowed back in by him and they agree to serve. It, it's going to be a very interesting juncture. We've never quite been here before. And I wonder if he's going to remember some of the nasty things uh, politicians around the world have said about him, including members of the Albanese government right here in yes. Australia. We've had senior ministers be very foolish in uh, tweeting things and saying things, mouthing off to uh, appeal to uh, the Twitter base. And uh, I think that's going to come back to haunt them because he yep. does tend to remember those, uh, remember. those uh, jibes. Uh, Douglas Murray, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Great pleasure. Thank you. Coming up, lefties losing it and Victoria's former top cop joins me with a stark warning for the Jacinta Allen government. Welcome back. Now it's time for Lefties Losing It. Let's start with CNN. Just a wealth of Lefties Losing It content right there every single day. And here's a uh, Oprah's best friend, uh, Gail King, and former NBA star Charles Barkley displaying an advanced, a very advanced case of Trump derangement syndrome. And... You know who embraced it more than anybody else? The black population. It's incredible. You see black people walking around with my mugshot. You know, they do shirts. When you heard that, what did you think? <sighs> Big sigh. First Big of all, sigh. I'm just going to say this. If I see a black person walking around with Trump mugs, I'm going to punch him in the face. Charles. I uh, know, Gil, 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 Gil. You, I, you really can't say that because, A, you don't mean that. You, oh, I mean that sincerely. <laughs> I'm going to just tell you something. And then you will be arrested for assault. I've got bad news for those two because, as we just discussed with Douglas Murray, the polls show that Trump has succeeded in winning support from black and Hispanic voters, according to these polls that we're seeing, poll after poll. The latest one is the New York Times Siena poll showing Hispanic voters actually now favour Trump over Joe Biden by a six-point margin and many more black voters are opting for Trump compared to previous Republican candidates. Now, talking about... Uh, the Democrats and Joe Biden. Let's check in on the president. We're on the eve of International Women's Day, so let's see if the president has any inspiring words for the ladies. We'll teach Donald Trump a valuable lesson. Don't mess with the women in America unless you want to get the benefit. Let's try to work that out. You said something like, uh, we'll teach Donald Trump a valuable lesson. Don't mess with the women in America unless you, unless you what? We'll teach Donald Trump a, a valuable lesson. Don't mess with the women in America unless you want to get the benefit. <laughs> you know what? I've, I've listened to that quite a few times. I've worked it out. He says, uh, we'll teach Donald Trump a valuable lesson. Don't mess with the women in America unless you want to get the benefit. I'm not sure what that means, but there you have it. Inspiring words indeed. <laughs> now for an array of lefties losing it thanks to the Supreme Court's unanimous decision. I'm not confident that that will produce a result that's good for American democracy. This is actually what I had been concerned about. I had been concerned that it should it go to the Supreme Court, they would rule this way. I'd laugh if it weren't so sad. My next guest says Donald Trump is still an oath-breaking insurrectionist. Do you have confidence in the Supreme Court? Do you think this court is partisan? The court itself may have overstepped. The court went way further than it needed to go. Our colleague Melissa Murray has called this Supreme Court the YOLO court. If that derangement wasn't enough. You then had these nincompoops humiliate themselves by trying to claim that really this was a 5-4 decision, not a unanimous 9-0 verdict. The headline here is this, that this is a unanimous ruling, but if you scratch the surface just a little... This is a 5-4 to four ruling on part of it. This is actually a 5-4 to four decision. It's 5-4. to four. Trump will take this, spin it, 
spread the misinformation, disinformation on it. So it's a win for them. He, he's on the ballot and voters will vote. And he, and he looks like he's headed to become the Republican nominee for president. You can't save a people from themselves. If they're determined to reelect him after he organized that insurrection, then there's nothing to stop the people from doing that. Insurrection. Anyone who seriously claims that is either crazy or lying. There are no other options at this point. Now, this shocked even me. Listen to two of our faves, a comic and writer, Constantine Kisson, and former Australian Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson, discussing what happens when lefties losing it are in power and drunk on power. In Russia last year, 400 people were arrested for things that they said on social media. 400 people in Russia. Obviously, this country is very different. How many people do you think were arrested in Britain for things they said on social media last year? Go on. Take a guess. I have no idea. 3,300. Really? Arrested for what they'd said on social media? Yeah. What sort of things get you well, arrested? Well, one example I give in my show is uh, there was a young woman from Liverpool uh, called Chelsea Russell, and people can look this up. Uh, her friend was killed in a car crash, a 19-year-old woman, and she posted the lyrics of his favorite song on her Instagram. And it was a rap song, so the lyrics contained several instances of the N-word. She was arrested, prosecuted, found guilty, given 500 hours of community service and a fine, tagged, and for a year she was under 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. curfew. My goodness. In Britain. In Britain. In 2018. Joining me now is the former Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police, Kel Glare. The head of the Victorian Police Association is urging the Victorian Labor government not to raise the age of criminal responsibility, insisting that it will just increase youth crime. Labor has committed to raise the age at which a child can be arrested, charged or jailed from 10 to 12 by the end of this year and then to 14 by 2027. But Victorian Police Association boss warns the frequency and severity of offending increases significantly from the ages of 12 and above. Kel, uh, what would your advice be to the Victorian government? Just simply to abandon all this you know, ideological ideology nonsense. Uh, you know, it's beyond belief that they would consider raising the age of criminality uh, to uh, 14. Uh, I heard recently that Male, young male's brain doesn't develop fully until they're 25 or so. Does that mean that we raise the age of criminality to 25? Don't give them ideas. Do it away with 80% of crime overnight. I mean, uh, it is ideology taking over common sense. Well, we see this over and over again. Are we having 10-year-olds locked up behind bars for petty offences? Is there a reason to actually reform the system to be even more lenient on youth crime? No, uh, Youth crime needs to have consequences. At the moment, we see young offenders bailed again and again and again. They're not tracked. They're not uh, monitored in any way. They get bailed, go out, and then maybe even within 24 hours they've re-offended, they get bailed again. Mm. They have no fear of consequences. And uh, the argument that they don't know they're doing wrong is also nonsensical because, of course, if they don't know they're doing wrong, why, does they run away? why do they run away when they're challenged? <laughs> um, I mean, people, um, kids learn what's right and wrong at a very early age. There's no question about that, particularly in this you know, information age. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think they're more sophisticated in many ways than, than previous generations. Uh, we had two well-publicised cases of youth crime this week in Victoria. A 13-year-old boy was charged over the alleged uh, false imprisonment and sexual assault of a 28-year-old female jogger in south-east Melbourne. And in Melbourne's uh, Altona, Bayside suburb, uh, three 14-year-old girls and an 18-year-old woman have been arrested for allegedly bashing an autistic teenager um, at the beach. Uh, more than 21,000 crimes were committed by children in the 12 months to September last year in Victoria, a third of which involved culprits that are aged 14 years and under. Uh, but, Kel, in a few short years, those crimes won't be counted in the official crime statistics. They won't be crimes. That's right, uh, and, and that's extremely problematic because what happens to the victims of these uh, mm. uh, things that are now crimes? Uh, how are they compensated? How are they going to be looked after? 
Victims are ignored in the criminal justice system. The whole criminal justice system is broken. Mm. There's no doubt about that, and no more so than in juvenile justice, where young offenders uh, you know, wait time and time again to go before the courts. When they do, uh, they regard as the badge of office because nothing happens to them. There's no really uh, anything dramatic that they have to worry about. And uh, we need to rethink the whole equation about how we deal with these things. And I'm not saying there need to be draconian penalties, but there needs to be consequences for these actions. And at the moment, there are no consequences. Mm. And of course, uh, this, we see the same pattern repeated again and again. And I would hate to see what happens when a 13-year-old is guilty of a home invasion, of a violent assault, a knife attack, and the victims are told, well, the age of criminal responsibility is 14 now, so that no not, crime has been committed. We don't wear it. I mean, that's really how, how do you do that? And, you know, in, in 1989, I introduced a policing skills program uh, to uh, really deal with this lack of education of some young people in relation to their obligations and responsibilities, as well as telling them about their rights. Mm. Uh, that program was extremely successful and went until 2006. In 2004, Monash University re reviewed the program, said it was achieving good results in the youth space, but it was being poorly managed. Mm. In 2006, the then Chief Commissioner Christine Nixon was told the same thing and instead of fixing the management problem, abolished the program. Well, this seems to be the problem. It is, seems to be ideologically driven. There's not much common sense. It's more about... Uh what their ideological position is to, to crime and punishment that is dictating much of the policy. Yeah, I, th I think punishment, you know, needs to be looked at in a wider spectrum. I mean, there's plenty of room for, for example, young offenders, home detention. Mm. They need to have tracking devices. Mm -hmm. um, they would have an exemption to go to and from school. Yep. Um, but uh, they need to be, when they're bailed, prohibited from contacting their co-offenders because that then breaks the cycle of peer pressure. There are quite a lot of things that can be done that are not draconian but have uh, a real impact in getting the message across that this kind of behaviour is unacceptable. And certainly the level of violence in offending, home invasions, carjacking and so on, has, has just grown out of mm. sight. Absolutely. So much so we've got people making these sort of suggestions, including a dad from the Melbourne Bayside suburb of Brighton calling on the state government to implement a home security rebate system uh, as he takes the youth crime wave plaguing his neighbourhood into his own hands. The father said his home security system alerted him to the presence of four teenagers in his home at 5am on Tuesday where he was with his family before they took off in the in an allegedly stolen car. So, Kel, we've got the, the punters out there coming up with these ideas. Uh, Unfortunately, and... look, Rita, that's again basing the onus on victims uh, rather people than... to protect themselves, rather than concentrating on those who are offending. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we see victims again and again and again being given the responsibility for keeping themselves safe, when really, uh, you know, as a society, uh, we have a police force uh, and a government, and between them they ought to be able to put in place measures to make sure that we are all safe. Absolutely. Carl Glare, thank you so much for your time this evening. And coming up next, shocking revelations about trans-affirming care causing cancer in young patients and more cases of two-tiered policing. That's up next. Welcome back. Joining me now is GB News host Darren Grimes. Darren, let's start with these leaked emails between doctors from a leading transgender healthcare body, which reveal they knew that trans patients do not always understand the consequences of their gender reassignment, surgery and treatments. And they also admit that some patients have developed cancer as a result mm -hmm. of their hormone treatment. The revelations stem from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health files uh, uncovered by independent journalist Michael Schellenberger. He also found a clinician who was prepared to recommend a double mastectomy for a 16-year-old girl who was already suffering from liver cancer. Now, this is despite 
<laughs> he, this uh, doctor agreeing with the girl surgeon and oncologist that her cancer was probably caused by the hormone treatment she was receiving. These revelations are so shocking, Darren. It's an enormous medical scandal and we have so many victims, so many victims uh, in the UK, the US and right here in Australia. Absolutely, Rita, you're bang on the money. And were this any other form of ideology in healthcare that was causing cancer, you can bet your bottom dollar that there would be outcry like you wouldn't believe. There would be a scandal called upon scandal, pearl clutching like you wouldn't believe. There would be lawsuits of a monumental scale. I mean, I tell you what, this W path or uh, they have me on the war path. That's what I'll tell you that for free, Rita, yeah. because th they basically seem to be saying that gender affirming care, which is basically the affirmation of anybody that says, oh, you know, I need to have a mastectomy or oh, I need to go on to these uh, generally irreversible hormone treatments that quite clearly we know precious little about. We know a little bit more now after these damning revelations. But this is medical misadventure and it doesn't actually purport purportedly. You know, these people say that they're the gold standard of healthcare. If you ask me, they absolutely are not. This is doctors under under the guidance of this trans body, nodding along to recommending dicey surgeries for minors. As you say, Rita, we're talking about a, a radical double mastectomy for a 16 year old girl with liver cancer. Now, cancer possibly from these hormones that they've been pumping her with in the first place. Why is there not more of an outcry about this? Why are politicians in Australia? Why are politicians in the United Kingdom, in the United States? Why are they not animated about this in a way in which they are quite mm. clearly about other uh, issues? This is my medical malpractice uh, sort of couched in the terms of medical affirmation. And I think it's really, really dangerous. This has put an ideology well above healthcare. You're 100% right, but at least in the UK, you did have an inquiry into these methods yeah. and this affirmation model, and there was some change in policy. Here in Australia, we're not even having the inquiry, and there's so little transparency around what's happening uh, with these treatments, how many kids are being treated, at what ages are they getting the hormones, at what ages are surgeries starting. Uh, uh, sadly, I think the Austra Australia is even further behind than the UK when it comes to this very important issue. Darren, the UK police force is under fire for perceived lack of policing when it comes to Palestinian protests. Uh, look at this footage where they are in huge numbers protecting a statue of Winston Churchill as pro-Palestinian supporters gather outside the Houses of Parliament. But we know they have the capacity to be much tougher. We saw that during those uh, anti-lockdown protests. And let's look at how they police football fans. This is what you get when you're a football fan. This is what football fans get. If I get a Palestine flag out, I'm safe. Joke. Darren, you can even hear the football fans reference the police's double standards there, saying they'd be left alone if they had a Palestinian flag. The public are noticing this two-tiered policing. Why should anybody basically have any... Uh, of an understanding, of, of an acknowledgement, of a trust in the police that actually young women, statues, you name it, will actually be there and be protected by our police force because it's it smacks of a two-tier policing, right? We've seen that multiculturalism mm -hmm. actually uh, it ain't robust. We've actually seen what? the desecration of war memorials. We've seen jihad called for, intifada called for. We've seen uh, the Jewish people in our country be uh, attacked or violence against them be called for. You know what, Rita? We just banged up a bloke in this country for two years for downloadable stickers and a Hitler photograph in his house here in Britain. Britain. But then we had a chap in our country filmed with police standing by him, raising his fist to do a Hitler salute. And was he pursued by the police? 
I certainly didn't see any action. Let's move along to Rishi Sunak, hoping that uh, Jeremy Hunt's budget measures, including freezing fuel duty for another year, freezing alcohol duty, overhauling the child benefits uh, system, whether well, well, is all that going to save the Tories at the polls, Darren? The, you're going to election later in the year. Is this going to be enough? It absolutely isn't, Rita. I mean, the, the Prime Minister had a perfect opportunity to, to to cover some of the themes that we've been discussing right now. Labour Party politicians seem far more interested, Rita, in talking about Gaza than they do Britain. And Rishi Sunak had an ideal opportunity at this budget to actually present an, op a, a, an opposition to that, an alternative vision. And he just simply hasn't done that. In fact, we just announced one million quid in that budget for a Muslim memorial, a war memorial. I don't know why we need independent individual religions to now have memorials. It, the fact of the matter was we were either mm. Commonwealth nations or British nations. But look, this will not save the Tories. We are at snail's pace growth. We haven't taken robust measures. Dare I say, Liz Trussell will be laughing all the way to the bank. She's very popular in America right now. That's our former prime minister. She said, actually, we needed radical reform in this country. Rishi Sunak seems to be going along... But the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, if I can put it bluntly, and I know you Aussies pretty much love a blunt approach to things. And there is no doubt in my mind right now that the Labour Party in this country and the Conservative Party in this country are two cheeks of the same behind. Right. You are voting for the same platform, the same prospectus. They're offering exactly the same thing, which is low growth, low aspiration and basically allowing rampant migration, mass migration to this country mm. to be utterly used and utterly abused. We need strong leaders like never before. I know you're a big Maggie fan, Rita. We need Margaret Thatcher back. If I could raise her from the dead, I'm hoping Elon Musk is going to come up with some new form of technology because I'm desperate, Rita. We're in desperate straits. This is a civilizational moment that we're facing in this country. And yet all we can talk about is cutting two pence off of national insurance in this country. It's just absurd. I feel like pulling my hair out and there's not much of it there to begin with. <laughs> now, I saw Home Secretary Suela Braverman, who, well, sorry, former Home Secretary, uh, she's come out and been quite critical of this budget. Uh, she said, uh, like you, th that this small cut is not enough. You need to incentivise work. Our tax system uh, decentivises work, she said. It could have been fixed today and uh, she had all sorts of measures. She was a uh, uh, proposing there, she's becoming more and more prominent along with Liz Trust, despite their demotion. I wonder if they're setting themselves up for a leadership challenge before the next election. That's going to be fascinating to watch. Now, before you go, I've got to ask you about this story. Uh, a Las Vegas dominatrix who claimed she kissed a 27-year-old Prince Harry uh, on one of his many infamous trips to uh, Las Vegas. You will remember the pictures from that trip. Well, she's now been banned from OnlyFans after teasing she had never before seen pics of the prince in the buff from their night together. Oh, I don't even know where to go with this story. What do you make of this bizarre tale, Darren? Well, do you know what? I never thought I'd say it, Rita, but actually OnlyFans must be pretty altruistic because I imagine they'd get a hell of a lot of money and subscribers out of the release of that photograph. But perhaps they know that Prince Harry himself is incredibly litigious and they'd be suffering the yes. hands of his Californian lawyers. But look, I, I don't think the world wants to see that right now. We've seen him pretty much in the buff, to be honest, because there were photographs released in the past. The Sun had those photographs here in Britain, released those. Yes. They were all over the internet in 2012. I don't think the world wants to see them these days, but do you know what? It's a reminder that everyone has a past and everyone's made mistakes. And perhaps this virtue signalling clown ought to look back at the, his past and remember that no one's perfect. And this, this idea, this vision of the world that he now has from his Californian mansion simply doesn't exist. You know, I, 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 feel for the, I fear for this woman, you know, perhaps if she's not too careful and she does release them on the internet who knows what's going to come for her because uh, his work's drying up Rita Yes and he does love a legal battle so he could perhaps launch one <laughs> against her but um, 
I, I would love to hear his excuses because, yes, he was a young man, but he wasn't a teenager. We're talking someone who was in their late 20s at this point. But uh, I don't know, does he blame white privilege? Does he blame the palace <laughs> for the uh, climate of, I don't know, to toxic masculinity that was created that led him to do this? That, that in itself would be quite interesting. Darren Grimes, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thanks, Rita. And that's it from me tonight. I'll see you Sunday morning for Outsiders and back again Monday at 11. Don't go anywhere. Newsnight is up next. Good night.